Welcome everybody. If you are in this talk, you probably want to know more about this extrospective world and you're in the right place. Uh, today, I want to share with you three different things about this extrospective post. The first one is the obvious one. What is extrospective? Uh, the second one is at Ivan we have an extrospective OSPO. Uh, we just turned one year old uh, in May, so now slightly slightly over one year old. And we did some learnings along the way and we want to share them with all of you. In case you want to build an extrospective OSPO, you will know what we suffered or what were the problems that we encountered along the way and also what worked. And finally, I want to talk to all of you about why this matters and why do we believe that more companies should have extrospective OSPOs or at least have a part of it which focuses on extrospective OSPOs. So, extrospective OSPO. And as the picture kind of says, it's reaching to the outer, to the outside, to the outer space. The formal definition of extrospective, which is a word, by the way, and it's a word that within our team we came up with like to describe what we do. Uh, so kudos to Ryan. Uh, extrospective is examining what is outside yourself. So it's the opposite of introspective. So we are used to introspections and introspectiveness, but we usually don't use the word extrospective. And in OSPO's terms is about working on things that they are outside of your company. So, extrospective. We are usually familiar with this definition of inbound and outbound OSPOs. And we've seen probably a diagram like that one or maybe something similar to this one. This is not about what they do, what the OSPOs do, it's about the focus of the OSPOs. So some OSPOs focus more on inbound, so taking in open source projects, and some of them focus more on outbound, and some of them focus equally on both. Today, I want to talk about a specific subset of these outbound OSPOs. So it's about the production of open source code. It's about the delivery of open source code. So just as a recap, uh, in case you don't know, probably everyone in the room knows, but just in case, which are the characteristics of the outbound? And usually is all revolving around creating policies for creating open source projects. We want to make sure that the company knows which steps to follow when we want to create a new open source project. Because we came with a great idea and we decided to open source this great idea triple thumbs up, so that's the way to go. And obviously we have this open source project, but we want to have not only that thing available, we want to have adoption of this open source project. We want to create communities around it. And that's also one of the aspects and, and points of the uh, outbound OSPOS, is to create those communities around those open source projects. We obviously talk a lot about governance because yeah, we need to make sure that everyone in the community understands how the project is governed and how to have an impact on these projects. So we talked about those things a lot. And obviously in contraposition from the uh, inbound, I suppose it's a different perspective. So we don't intake the code, we produce code and it's about producing code to the rest of the world. I have a reflection for you now. So given this picture you see here, it, it's kind of a small diagram, uh, like it's, it's a simplification and it's, nobody will use this thing. But imagine we have this shop web server, which then talks to two different services among many other ones, pricing service and stock service, which in its own turn, talk to a database. So pretty easy, pretty straightforward. My question to you, my reflection to you is, would you consider it a risk if one of those projects, like any of those ones, doesn't matter which one, the pricing service, the stock service, or the shop web service, was maintained by your developers on the free time? You can raise your hands if do that thing, uh, but you would consider it a risk. I'm a recording, so I will not see if you raise your hands, but I am guessing that many people are raising hands, sometimes even two hands saying, 
that should never happen. We should never leave parts of our critical infrastructure unmaintained or just left for the developers to be maintained on the free time. So my question to you now is why are we accepting it when it comes to open source? So that database might be Postgres. The services might use whatever open source framework. And again, the web, the web server is also an open source web server. So why are we leaving the maintenance of those open source projects and components for the rest of the community to work on whenever they can? Some of them might be on their free time as well. And most of the time it's not even by your own developers. So why we find it acceptable? And that's when the extrospective come into play. So that's why, what is our focus? Our focus is working towards ensuring that the critical infrastructure is actively maintained. And obviously we put a focus on the open source projects that belong to our critical infrastructure. We want to have projects that do not depend on a single company, organization or individual. Uh, by that one, we mean that we want to reduce the bus factor. And if we have more companies who contribute to open source projects, we will have more different backup tools and companies backing up those projects and, and, and they will be more healthy because they will not just depend on one single company, organization or individual. We will increase that bus factor. Related to this previous one, uh, we want to have a diversity of opinions. And by that one, we mean that the more people from different backgrounds that they are involved in these projects, the more diverse opinions and visions we will have. And again, if it's only like just for the sake of having different companies backing them up, so affiliation of contributors is more diverse, that will already be an improvement because there will be just different points of view for that project and there will be healthier and better discussions. And of course, we want to relieve the workload of the current maintainers because that's the pain of many open source projects. Maintainers are overloaded and they need help and we want to help them. The mission of this kind of extrospective OSPOS is as follows ensure the sustainability and secure the future of the open source software infrastructure used in your company. So we want to make sure that the open source software infrastructure is treated equally as any other service or part of your infrastructure. So it should be actively maintained by your company. And we do it through the extrospective OSPOS. Now, I want to share with you what we learned. So as I mentioned before, uh, we do have an OSPO, which is an extrospective OSPO at Ivan, and we just turned one year old and we want to share some of the things we learned along the way. So first of all, I want you to introduce you to the um, Ivan's OSPO. So what we do at the Ivan's OSPO is contribute to third party open source projects. You could have guessed that because of the extrospective that I mentioned before, right? So the projects we contribute to, for example, are Apache Kafka, Apache Flink, Postgres, OpenSearch, among many others. So basically the, the big chunk of work we do is mostly on those external projects, on those third party projects. And we also do have some open source projects on our own from Ivan, so first party open source projects, but the main focus and goal is to contribute to those ones to the ones seen here. And as I said, more to come, like Apache Cassandra, like uh, Redis, like M3, anything that we use in I at Ivan and we, is in, we consider it part of our critical infrastructure. Uh, disclaimer, I need to put this thing around. And again, that happens when you work with extrospective OSPOS. The projects we have here, that are listed here, do not belong to Ivan. Obviously, they belong to their own respective owners. Kafka, Flink would belong to Apache, OpenSearch, AWS, and Postgres, it's a Postgres thing. Some facts about Ivan's OSPO. We are around 10 people. Uh, we are organizing chapters, and each chapter is focusing on a open source project. 
for open source project ecosystem. So for example, we have one chapter for Kafka and its ecosystem, another one for Flink and its ecosystem, Postgres and uh, OpenSearch and so on. So every people is in there, is in a chapter and we have at least two people in each chapter. So people are not alone and they can collaborate and contribute together to open source projects. We are distributed, I think that is uh, an obvious fact, but we are all around the globe and we have people in US, Canada, Europe, and it basically we are not anymore bound to a single location. And we are in a growing phase. I said that we are around 10 people and we want to double and even go bigger, or farther than double the size of our team for the next, this year. And as I said before, we turned one year old in May. So we are happy. Um, the principles we are running with. Uh, we want to put the community first. And that thing is important to understand from within the company and to outside of the company. We are not there to push any kind of Ivan's agenda. We are there to help the community. We want to look at what are the problems the community is facing at the moment, and we want to help there. We don't take requests from Ivan and treat them like these are things that needs to be done. We read the community needs and we work upon those. Uh, we want to be recognized, but don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not meaning like we want to be individually recognized or be heroes in that. We want to be part of the community. We want to be seen as a net contributor to communities of the open source projects. We want to make sure that we have an impact on those communities. We want to be transparent and we are transparent, meaning that every contribution that we do uh, at work time, it's basically one of the things we do is it's contributed through the Ivan email on the Git uh, commit email. So we, we always make sure that it's clear that we are doing things in our work time and that contribution is sponsored or it's done at work time by Ivan. So we don't hide this fact and we are transparent and forward with it. And it's more than just production of code. Uh, uh, obviously, we do a lot of things in production of code. We contribute a lot of code, but we also do other things that it's not just only contribution of code. We also do pull request reviews, documentation writing, uh, bug uh, reproduction, because we, sometimes there is a bug report, but there is no reproducer. So that's also some of the things that we do and we need to take care of. Some of the oddities or some of the things that some companies might have a hard time when trying to create an extrospective OSPO. So the first one is the obvious one. The IP, the intellectual property of the code produced is not owned by the company. So we contribute to third party projects, meaning that the IP is owned by those third parties and not anymore in our case, by Ivan. So that's something that some companies need to get their head around and understand that's a good thing. It's not a blocker and we should enable those things. We have little to no control over the backlog. And by that, I mean that Ivan itself doesn't control end to end the backlog of those projects. As I said before, it's Postgres, it's Apache Kafka, it's Apache Flink. We, we don't control end to end those backlogs. We can influence them, we can have our own opinion there, but we don't control the whole thing. The same thing comes with timings. We cannot decide when something needs to be merged or when something needs to be released. We can give our own opinion and we can try to convince the community, but again, we don't own the timings. And one thing that probably will be a question happening hopefully only inside the companies, but hopefully people in this room, we should not have this discussion or question is, but aren't you collaborating with competitors? We should stop this competitive thing. And when we work on open source, we are not competitors, we are just colleagues. We are collaborating together, building these open source projects. So we should stop having this competitor mindset thing. We are collaborating, we are joining efforts, people from different backgrounds and different affiliations on a common goal, which is an open source project. So hopefully this question only happens 
within the company, you just need to convince them and that's not happening around us and among us. So now I want to play a game with you. Let's build a next perspective OSPO. So let's start. So what do you need? So we have a company, it has the full support. Everyone said, yes, let's sign off. We build the extrospective OSPO, let's go for it. So the first thing you wanna know is, okay, we might need developers, right? So what type of developers do we need? So let's start. The first thing we need to find out what's the focus of those developers. Developers should probably forget about these quick turnarounds that we are optimizing our life for. And by that, I mean this thing. You code something, you release it, you observe, you fix what you observed wrong, and you release again. You observe again, you fix whatever is not working, you release again, you observe, and that's an end of the cycle. And what developers most of the times do now, product developers do, is optimize this cycle to be as quick as possible. That should not be the focus of the developers working on this extrospective OSPOS because that's not how open source project works. We need to have different focus. We need to focus on how can I have this feature? How can I convince enough people that that's a good feature to have in the project? And how can I write code that it's easy to maintain in the future by people who is not me? Another crucial aspect of the developer, so another developer trait that we are looking for is autonomy. And you might say, yeah, uh, we always look for this one. You're right, but probably we want to look for even more autonomy in this particular case. So we want the developers to be self-driven. And why? Because as I said before, you might organize them in chapters, each of them focusing on a community and they will be the experts on those communities. So they need to be quite autonomous in deciding what they work on next. They should know how to prioritize their own work. They need to see, I can work on A, B, C and D. Right now, D is the most important thing that I should be working right now and hence I work on that one. And that's something that they need to be have a good sense of uh, grasping. Another trait that is interesting, awareness. They need to be able to understand the community needs. So in order to be autonomous, on the, as we said before, you need to be able to read what the community needs at each point in time. And what would be the best place to put my time that would get a bigger benefit for the community. So return of time invested on community gains. And that's what they need to do. They need to understand the community needs. And one of the most important aspects of these type of developers that we're looking for is resiliency. I guess everyone in the room contributed to open source at least once, and maybe some of you only once because of that. Um, resiliency, many changes that we propose will be rejected and not always because of technical reasons, sometimes because of political reasons. Also, not all communities are the most welcoming communities, but we might wanna change those. So we might need to be in for a ride before we can change them. So that's why we might need some people with uh, some resiliency to be able to change things from within or to endure the process of trying to push a complicated feature and convincing lots of people around in the community to have something done. And that's something that it's a different trait we need to look for. So these were the four main things that we identified that we, when we need to look for a developer. So now we know what type of developer are we looking for. Now let's start hiring. So we talk to our talent acquisition people and we say, look, that's the kind of person I'm looking for. That's the type of developer I'm looking for. Let's get them. So the first consideration that we need to have when creating a team is that the team composition is crucial. Again, you might say, Joseph, that's quite an obvious thing. Yes, but let me explain what I mean. Having existing community members speeds up onboarding newcomers. 
when you have a newcomer to a community, to an open source community, it might take quite some time until they realize and understand the written and unwritten rules of the communities. So having somebody who is already a member, an existing member of those communities helps a lot. And that's something we learned. There is a problem though. Uh, those existing members of the community, usually if I ask you what could be an ideal candidate for you, given those uh, that they need to be an extrospective OSPO developer, so they need to contribute to other projects, what you would say, probably you would say, I want a committer, right? But then the question is, how many committers are there? Uh, given a project, you probably have, I don't know, 20 committers, 30 committers, maybe 40, if it's a really, really big project. So from those committers, maybe, I don't know, five, six, seven, they left the project altogether. Some of them, they maybe moved to another stage in their careers. So we are left maybe with 20 people in the world who fit our ideal label. So as you can see, that's not quite scalable. And we might need to not search for this ideal candidate and we might need to look for more uh, easy areas to get people, which is existing contributing members, they might or might not be committers, but they, if, if it's good, it's good if they would have already some knowledge of the community. So regular contributors are a good place to place these ones. But again, having the committers is a really, really tough one. Again, it's kind of obvious around the globe. Uh, we said that pool is small and if we still, if we on top of that say no, you can only be in this particular location, kind of forget about it, right? So uh, you, we need to hire the talent where they are. And that means, hello, multiple time zones. Uh, you might have people all around the globe. And that's a challenge as well, because if you want to have a team cohesion and feeling of a team, you need to uh, work against those time zones differences sometimes. So you need to be mindful as well when you're creating the team on the time zones where the people are and what's your plan on having people on different time zones. And if you will have only one person on one specific time zone, that's something you need to look really carefully and make sure that that person is not feeling isolated. So these are the restrictions that we're having on, on hiring. So one of the things that we obviously think about is, okay, maybe we can grow some talent uh, because it's not only about hiring, sometimes it's about hi growing your own talent, right? So one of the things that every company can do is promoting uh, programs to promote open source contributions internally. At Ivan, we have something called Plankton Program. Uh, as we have a crab, many of the names that we use are kind of sea creatures or environment things in this sea. So plan and program is crucial for the open source ecosystem. Well, we, we think that that's a nice way to contribute back to the open source ecosystem. And basically it means that every Ivan or every person at Ivan who contributes to open source on the free time, they will get compensated with money. They will get paid for those contributions. So how it works is that each uh, person who wants to contribute to open source projects at the end of the month, they report how many hours they contributed to and they will get paid by the end of the month. So that's only when they do contributions outside of work and that's not restricted to developers. It's also valid for graphic artists, for project managers, for typewriters, copywriters, anything like that. Any contribution to open source is welcome and qualifies for this work. On top of that, every time that a developer or project manager or graphic artist hits a problem on an open source project or a need on an open source project during their work time, they can also, they are also encouraged to work on those open source projects. And we want that thing to happen. We want to uh, create the culture that contributing to upstream is not just a anomaly or a really strange thing to do. It's common, you find a problem upstream, you contribute it back to it. And that's the philosophy you want to have. And growing, having that one, it's easy to grow talent to be able to contribute to those environments. So now we have developers 
and probably want to have some management around it. We want to make sure that these people are enabled and that they know exactly what to do and make the better out of them. So learnings we made along the way. A new tool set, probably you need a new type of tools. The areas of impact that you might be used to are limited and timing and responsibilities are not anymore only on your responsibility tool. They are usually external. So that means that, for example, when a team is struggling and they don't manage to release as often or they don't manage to finish issues that often or solve problems that often, sometimes you see it's because they don't have an end-to-end -end responsibility chain or because they are they were working too isolated and they do need, didn't pair or didn't collaborate on solving those problems. So you might want to shake the teams up, change the uh, responsibility of the teams, but that's suddenly something you cannot do on extrospective OSPOS. The community owns every all these things that you want to change, so you cannot change them. Another thing, is you need to be more of a coach. You need to be an enabler. You need to ask the right questions. You need to help people become diverse versions of themselves. And it's about being like a coach, like um, not being the, the front foremost and trying to be the, all the spotlights on me. The, spoil, the spotlight is on the developers. And as a manager, you need to make sure that they are on the right place doing the right thing at any point in time. Related to the previous one, you need to be a different leader. And you will be, lots of the times, you will re realize that you're not the expert in the room. The people that you manage, the people in your team, are the experts on those communities that they are working on. And you need to rely on them to know what makes sense to do next. And you need to enable them so they can do the best on their work. But suddenly you are not relying on your technical expertise. You are not leading from that technical expertise. You lead from another place, from a more coaching side. You need to enable them and make sure that they are the best developers they can be. So we have the managers, we have developers. And now the question comes. When, when I was uh, interviewing for Ivan, I asked this question. And how do we measure success? The answer at that point in time, it was, that's something we want to discover together. And that was one of the reasons why I joined. And that's what we came up with. So we, we, I will share with what we came up with, but first let me show what are the things we learned that we can't not do. So the main question is, what do we measure? So we don't control a substantial part of the process. Releases, merges, when people do code reviews, all those things depend on the community. So if you want to define a like fixed timeline to say, okay, I want to measure how good are we doing, we need to be really careful what we can measure because there is a lot of things that we will be measuring that have a lot of the impact is depending on externalities. So we will not be measuring our team, but maybe we will be measuring the community instead of the team itself. So time is an illusion. That means that if I'm giving myself this three month time window, like I want to measure every three months, I want to see how uh, people are performing. I want to see how they are working and evolving and having this uh, three month checkpoint. Nobody else in the world cares about these three months that I'm saying, that I'm setting there. Nobody else. In the community, nobody cares about these three months. Nobody even knows about those three months. So anything about these three months is to be ignored. So probably we need to move away from those timescales. So a proposal. So what we came up with, and that's what I was really excited when I joined, I said, okay, then let's try something, let's build something. Some of the things might be slightly fluffy or like soft, but that's what we could do. That's what makes sense 
that's what makes sense and what we uh, think that is working for this whole year. Again, that's measuring performance on an individual level. And then for a team level, there is another picture. So what we want to measure, one of the KPIs that we want to measure is number of issues worked on. And it means work on, not merged, not reviewed. It's basically what we spend time trying to fix. So we want to have impact on issues that the community is facing. So working on those ones is something we want to count and we want to optimize for. The more community issues we work on, the better. Another thing we want to count and measure is the number of patches reviewed. And that's something that depends solely on us. We can always go to the pull request tab on GitHub if we are in GitHub, check there and review those PRs. We can also go to the mailing list if that's how the project contributes patches to and review those patches that are there. Give your opinion on code that is given by others because that's one of the bigger bottlenecks on open source projects. Uh, we want to have community engagement. That's another thing we want to measure and we want to increase. And by community engagement, we mean blog posts, mailing list uh, collaboration, or like writing on mailing list, answering questions there, uh, give talks, uh, bug reports, or reproducers of bug reports that they don't have any reproducer. Anything that is engaging with the community and making the community more vibrant, that's something we can measure and we can just try to make an impact on that one. That, those three things rely solely on us and we can have an impact. And that's an individual. Then as a team, we can measure over time, like when time is infinite, time doesn't matter. And then we can just basically say on the long run, on not giving any time frames, how many of the tasks of the issues we worked on are merged? How many of them are not merged? What are the reasons why they're not merged? And that's the way to measure the team's performance. But individually, for each person in the extrospective OSPO, that's what we do to measure the performance. So now we are all set and we can just start our extrospective OSPO and do hard work. And hopefully we will see the results in some time. There is another big thing. Do not expect results immediately. That's a marathon, not a sprint. Now I'm entering the last part of my talk, which is why does it matter? Why do we believe, and I believe as well, that we should be doing more extrospective OSPOs or OSPOs should have a extrospective part. So the first one is because it's more than just money, more than money. Monetary donations solve massive problems in open source projects and they are great and we should continue doing monetary donations and we should have funds created and we should find better ways on how we can donate money to bodies that they can make sure they reach the right places. That's needed, absolutely. And we need something more. We also need people. The maintenance burden, it's only reduced with more people. If we have two people, no matter, no matter how, many, how much money more they have, it's still only these two people. And we rely solely on these two people. So probably what we want is not to have only two people on that project, but maybe four, maybe six, maybe 10 people, 20 people on that project who know this project and can maintain this project. That's a more sustainable way. And maintenance will be, the maintenance burden will be reduced when we can share it among different people. And the more people, the better. And we believe that's a scalable solution because the more extrospective OSPOs we have, the more open source developer mass we will have. So join this journey and we will have more developers contributing to open source projects and the more of us that there will be, the more will be scattered around different open source projects and the more mass of developers contributing to those open source projects will be on the critical path of open source projects. And if we have more developers, that means that those ones will be more secure, the projects. 
So the developers will contribute to projects and those projects will be more secure. By that, I don't mean that we will prevent incidents. They will happen. The only thing is that when they happen, because they will happen, we will react faster. And the more people we have, the faster will we, be, we will be able to react. But it's not about avoiding those ones or preventing those ones. We will prevent some of those, but it's not about reducing them to zero. And that's a nice, nice line that should everyone have one? So should everyone have an extrospective voice poll? And my answer to this, answer to this question is no. And you might be wondering, Joseph, you had a talk explaining us why we should have one. And now you tell me that we don't need one. That's not exactly what I mean. What I mean is that every company who could afford it should have one. And having an extrospective OSPO is not cheap. It costs money. So we should be, we want to have extrospective OSPOs who are there for the long run. And for that reason, it would be great if companies who have already a way of uh, living, a, a, a business model that is useful, uh, sorry, that is working and sustainable, those companies should be contributing to these external parties, to these third party open source projects. So they should have maybe not a full, like a, a independent extrospective OSPO, but at least an extrospective part on their OSPOs. Because you should have an OSPO as well. So if you can afford it, you should have one. And I have one call to action for all of you right now, which is let's build shared open source projects together. If you want to read more about all these things that I talked today, uh, there is a blog post about Ivan's OSPO one year later, and you can read that thing. That's the link and don't worry you will have a QR code leading to those slides in a moment. Uh, there is a video recording of a, a meetup slash podcast, video podcast uh, from contributing today, which is called Do You Even OSPO with members of Ypro and um, Spotify and Ivan as well. So myself was in there. Uh, how to convince your manager to start an OSPO. That's a bit piece that I wrote on the to do a blog post. And if you want to know more about Ivan, that's a link about Ivan. Thank you very much for attending this talk. That's a QR code that will bring you to these slides. This is a website. You can just uh, watch it every time you want and it scrolls through the slides. My name is Josep Prat. My uh, Twitter handle is the one you see below there. And if you tweet something, please, I would love to see this thing trending, you know, some way. Extrospective OSPO. That's the word that I'm trying to coin as maybe you can have guessed. And Thank you very much for attending uh, my talk and let's have more extrospective OSPOs. Thank you.